Support for another round comes from Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com today for a domain experience that's transparent and easy to set up. Just make sure you enter offer code another round at checkout to get 10% off. Make your next move with Squarespace. Hey everyone, Eleanor from the Pod Squad here. I just wanted to share with you some very exciting news, and that is that Another Round is having a live show in Chicago, and we want to see you there. Join us on June 21st at Thalia Hall for a live taping of the podcast. It's going to be amazing. It's part of WBEZ's Podcast Passport series. And tickets go on sale on Friday, May 5th. And for more information, go to wbez.org slash events. I mean, we could start just talking about chicken. I mean, we can <laughs> turn this entire podcast into a conversation about chicken. This is Chicken Talk with Evan and Tracy. <laughs> We're talking chicken. Hi, everyone. I'm Heaven. I'm Tracy. And welcome to another round with Heaven and Tracy. Ow! Ow! I also go by Jinky Slip. Do you? <laughs> Jinking all the slips. This gets worse every time we say it. What? Why are we here? What? What is? What are we doing on the show today? Why are we here? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are here today because we are so hyped to have Kim Drew in the stud, aka Museum Mammy, aka the best screen name mon- monkey monkeyer. <laughs> Ma- <laughs> I, I had no idea what she was going for. So thank you. Um, so the powers that be, aka our producers, aka our moms, just buzzed in to tell us that it is indeed moniker. Moniker. Is it really how you say it? It's definitely moniker. moniker. What were you saying? Monkier. That was monk. No monkier, not monkier. Um. Okay. <laughs> Heaven, God damn it. <laughs> this is a disaster. So Miss Kim Drew has the best moniker ever, which is Museum Mammy. Mm-hmm. Imagine um, you're a British person trying to pronounce the word Monica. Moniker. Oh, bummer. <laughs> Moniker. <laughs> you know what? That is a great... You're welcome. Thank you. Thank um, you. I first ran into her work through the Tumblr Black Contemporary Art, mm-hmm. and I was so excited to find a thing that was like, oh my god, this felt so targeted towards me. Mm-hmm. Like, I love Tumblr. I see myself. I love the Blacks. Mm-hmm. I love the arts. Right. Combine all of them. And that's you. Yes. So mm-hmm. I'm so excited to talk to her. I, I want to talk about art. Let's talk about art. And then we're also going to talk to Tunde Alani Ron, who Ooh. you may remember from our Live in Michigan show. Yes. Um, He's awesome. He's great. He's going to pop in and update us on some stuff. He's Maybe. also an artist. See, that's the wrong language. I've tried to Oh, oui, wee. Oui. Oui. There you go. <laughs> One thing I've learned is that sometimes the the French say we oui, like wah. Oui. Wah. Oui. Especially oui. if they're Canadian. Yeah. French Canadian. Um so, I learned oui. this when I was watching Home Alone in French. Oh, look when at I, you. When, I mean, you know, I don't mean to brag, but in seventh grade, I was pretty fucking fancy. Okay. Um. So, yeah, we have a great episode of Hennessy drinking and art talking and tune day Alani running. Let's get into Let's it. Let's do it. So I am here in the stewed solo with the great Tunde Alana Ryan. Um, Heaven is busy hanging out, making a little show with Stephen Colbert, whatever. Um, but we love her and we miss her. Tunde is amazing. He is a musical artist. He has got the most flawless skin and hair I've ever seen in my life. Just, just a peach, just a doll with so many great and smart, important things to say. Um, Mr. Tunde Alani Ron. Hi, Hi. I'm really excited to be here. (laughs) I'm glad that you're here because when you hit me up to hang out since you were going to be in town, Mm -hmm. my first thought was, yes, absolutely. (laughs) And then I was like, maybe you'll come back to the podcast because one of my favorite things after that show that we did with you Mm. was watching all of the tweets come in through the Another Round account. I'm like, oh my gosh, I love, I'm so glad you just introduced me to the best. So I'm excited to reintroduce you to the one who already know. I'm excited to meet because I feel like everyone that I've been connected to since then has been an ama- like amazing. Aww. Just even on Twitter, like just the people that follow this podcast, uh-huh. I feel like have their own community and just yeah, I'm into Aww. it. Well, let's keep the goodness going for 2017 because we, we, we need it. We are going to need it. 
But first, I have honestly been wanting to tell this story on this podcast since this crazy ass thing happened to okay. me. I know. Okay. Um, and I'm so glad that you're here because heavens, I really heard the story. Okay. So it would have been very boring for me to retell it to her. Right. So we're going to do a What It Happened Was, which I don't think we've done in a while. Uh, if you're just tuning into the show, I'm kind of obsessed with, and when I say obsessed with, I mean terrified of being like serial killed or assaulted or something i know so this is transformed into a deep love of true crime shows and like documentaries oh, and stuff okay. i know it makes sense in my head i feel like that's why people like those kind of shows though i think so too like yeah. it's, it's an expression of like our anxiety over it's like a therapy thing. like where you have to hold the spider when you're scared of spiders right, or something yeah. right yeah. yeah and also for me it just kind of like keeps me woke because i'm just like walking <laughs> down the street oh. literally <laughs> So the bad, the the good thing is that it's. I assume that it's kept me safe in some regard. But the bad thing is that I'm constantly like scanning the room for like, <laughs> <laughs> which one of y'all motherfuckers looks like you got a body in your basement? Oh my god. <laughs> okay, so this this is one of those stories, right? So um, what happened was a friend of mine um, and I were out on the town, not really on the town, just like out drinks, you know, like bar hopping, restaurant hopping, whatever. Okay. And we ended up at this bar. It was completely empty. And so we walk in, we're sitting, we're drinking. Fine, you look so nervous already. I'm not, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like holding myself. I'm like, okay, yeah. So we sit down and we're having some drinks, you know, whatever. It's 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 a Wednesday night at a bar at like eight o'clock. You know, nobody's out. Mm-hmm. But me, my black ass. <laughs> um, and so we're sitting and we're drinking and we're talking. And then this uh, couple walks in the bar. Um, and as soon as I saw them, I was like, they about to be on some bullshit. You know how, like, your intuition just, mm-hmm. like, you know, like, watch out for these two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something's gonna happen. And I didn't think, like, anything malicious was gonna happen, but just, like, she's probably gonna try to touch my hair or some shit, you know? <laughs> like, so it was a, it was a white woman, uh, Oh, you know, yeah, just, so probably, no, sorry. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> so like, that's where it not. came from. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> let me, let me guard my tresses. Uh, so there's a white woman who walks in first, and she's just, you know, she looks like, Somebody that you who works in HR at okay. your job. So, um, so she walks in and behind her is this man, and he's very like, I want to say goofy looking, but I feel like it's too shady. <laughs> so he's in like this this trench coat, and he's got on a bow tie, and he had very he was a black man. He had mm. very curly hair and like mm. glasses, and kind of like dorky yet it's like adorkable is how if you okay. were a white man in a sitcom, he would be described as adorkable. Got gotcha. it. Okay. And he stops, and he's got, I noticed that he's got this British accent, but it sounded very fake to me. Um, <laughs> and he stops, and he's just like, well, this is lovely. This is lovely. This is lovely. Oh, great British accent for me. And so they leave, and they go sit at the opposite end of the bar. Mm. And it's obvious that they are, like, nine sheets to the wind, right? Just drunk, just, like, out. Gone. Okay. And we actually talked to the bartender later. He was like, yeah, I almost didn't serve them. Like, they were that drunk. And so um, they go sit down, and I look at my friend, and I'm just like, they're they're gonna come back. Just like this isn't over. Mark my word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not over. They're gonna come back. And so, sure enough, I look over my shoulder, and there's like this really big mirror on the wall, so that I could see what was going on behind me. You're and really prepared him. for these scenarios. Listen, like... <laughs> I try to keep my eye on all the exits. I'm like, bet mirror back here. I just glance over every once in a while. Like I'm I'm serious about not getting serial killed. Okay. <laughs> Very serious. And I say I. I tell him I was like they're feeling us out for something. Something hmm. is something ain't right. Like hmm. my antenna's on. It's just do 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 do. Like something's going on. Mm-hmm. So they go sit down, and this time they both stand back up and come over to us, I don't right? Like that. And I'm like, oh shit, they're like triangulating. Going on. Like no, this isn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I feel like he's like going back and like feeding her information or something. Uh, so they come back, and I'm like, all right, this is whatever's about to happen is about to happen now, right? So I'm like bracing myself, but I'm still smiling. I'm still nice. And then here's where here's where the shit starts. So the man starts telling us, he's like, have you heard of the Players Club? Uh, and I'm like, the movie from the 90s? What you know about the Players Club? He's like, no, 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 no. It's a, it's a, it's a club in New York City. That hunts and, people. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's like in my mind. That's like where I think this is I going. Mean, but, but okay. really, though, yeah. <laughs> like, like oh, honestly, God. yeah. Okay. But he's like, no, it's this club that was founded by um, Edwin Booth a long time ago. And I'm thinking, I'm like, you talking about John Wilkes Booth's brother, the man who assassinated the president of the United States? He got a club. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they be, they be turned up. Uh, but he seems sort of surprised that I knew that. Huh. And I'm like, first of all, don't underestimate me. I know my history. Excuse me. Uh, 
And so whenever we asked for details of the club and what they do there, he would just he would always go back to it was founded by Edwin Booth. It was founded by we're like okay, but we like get it, yeah. But... And he was like trying to get us to go to the club. I was like, so we leave with you and we get there and we walk in like. What do we do? He's like, oh, you just, you know, you sit on, you have a drink or two. And it was founded by Edwin Booth. I was like, all right, you want some other shit. So at one point, the lady is like, yeah, the whole cast of Hamilton was there last week. What? Yeah. And I'm like, this is a very interesting lie for you to tell me because I know <laughs> some of the cast of Hamilton. So I'm like, oh, really? And so like, I start naming some names. She's like, yeah. Yeah, they were there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my friend makes up a completely like, just makes up a name like, oh, Marshawn uh, Jones, was he there? And she was like, yeah. But then she was like, you're trying to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, shit, the jig is up, the jig is up. So the next day, I go home and I'm like, all right, let me do some due diligence mm -hmm. and see who I can like rustle up. So first I DM'd Lemon Well Miranda, um, who was too busy winning all the awards, couldn't get back to me about this, about me being serial killed almost. Um, Lynn, if you're listening. Priorities. Where your ass was at? Yeah. You know, I had needed you when you wasn't even there for me. But then I DM um, the guy who played Hercules Mulligan. His name is Oak. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, have you ever heard of this Players Club place? Have you ever been there? He was like, nope, never heard of it, never been there. He was like, I'll shade to her. I don't trust her. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, don't fuck around with it. Don't fuck around. And I was like, bet, thank you. I'll shade to her. I'll shade to her is exactly what he said. So in my head, I'm like, they tried to lure us out to some alley to murder us. My friend was like, yeah. they tried to lure us to a club to have sex with us. I don't know why <laughs> those two things would be. I mean, it could have I been mean, both, I mean, you know, it could have been. It could have been. We could have had a great little swinging time and then, eh, and then I'm out and then I'm dead. So whenever this happens to me, I always feel two things happen. On the one, I'm like, Tracy, you're ridiculous. Like, these are two drunk people who are trying to get you to go to some exclusive club that they think is fancy. Mm. And then on the other side, I was like, bitch, you did it again. You just got out. <laughs> you lived your life. You're going to see another day. You're going to live another week. You keep us up. You might live long enough to have kids and shit. You feel like I do feel crazy. I feel like you're going to be like, you're like my Nigerian grandmother who I was just in the UK and I was taking care of her. And mm -hmm. like, no matter what I told her, if I was like, mom, I went to, to, to the Tate Museum. To, I saw it. She's like. It's so dangerous. You walked by yourself. Uh -uh. <laughs> so it's either like I'm escaping death or I'm getting like, you know, char overcharged. Uh huh. Uh huh. Or if, if I'm eating food that's not from her kitchen directly, you know that's also an insult. So you she's like, she's like, what did you eat? Uh uh. <laughs> Tunde, oh. I've noticed. That I mean, the news cycle is just insane, mm -hmm. and it seems harder for anything, especially now that's not Trump related, to stay like right. at the top of the cycle. Um, and Flint is still a thing. You are from Flint, Michigan, originally. I am, and nobody's talking about it anymore. Nobody's mm. tweeting about it anymore. Every once in a while, I see a tweet that says Flint still doesn't have clean water, yeah. which boggles my mind to think about. You know, and then. There was this news that they're making a movie about it starring Cher, and I'm just like, the very least I could do, <laughs> the very least is put a black person in the shit, like in the middle of it, you know? So tell us about things that we need to know about Flint right now at the top of 2017. Yeah, so I kind of just took a minute to look around. I talked to some people, different organizers and activists, and tried to put together the things that stuck out to me the most mm -hmm. and just living in Flint too. So I think number one, is we've had about 200 homes that have had their water lines actually replaced. So some of mm. that federal money has been spent. But the okay. problem is, like a lot of cities, the infrastructure is very old. And mm. so it's really hard to map out where the lines are. Mm -hmm. And lead lines are, are very easily broken. Mm. But also um, the way that they've been connected to people's houses. There was this like really... I don't want to say hilarious because it's kind of sad, but instead of any kind of maps of water lines, someone had something like 45,000 note cards, like, noting where wow. lines were. Like, it's just this very old infrastructure, and, like, mm. that's a problem across the country. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, so we've been finding that um, it's going to be a lot more expensive than I think than people realized even mm. a few months ago. So that's one thing. It's happening, but it's very, very slow. The second thing, which is kind of funnier, is just the share, doing mm. the Lifetime movie, and I, I feel like... <laughs> everyone in Flint, if you post it, if you say it, you just kind of get, like, a side eye, like, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay, I see. I okay, see thanks for the water bottles, but yeah. you could, you know, you could not. <laughs> <laughs> you you have the not. option to not. Right. Yeah, yeah. I didn't think you, there was an option to not, and sometimes you just need to not. Yeah, but. I 
I would have thought, I don't remember how old I was when Last of the Mohicans came out, but even then I was like, this is this is about a white man. Like, stop casting white folks as like the cent- as the saviors and as the central, most important figures in these big brown ass stories. You know? I mean, Lifetime could just write us a check. You know, uh, if you really wanted to, just put those in people's possible. houses. You know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lifetime. I mean, coin, if you're you could, yeah, Lifetime. If you're listening. Yeah, you could not, but you could coin. <laughs> put a put a coin right there. I love it. Yeah. I love it. You could not, but you could coin. We yes. need it. That's mm-hmm. like a universal message. Uh, I guess number three. Um. There's such a lack of transparency, and it's mm-hmm. really disrespectful to the citizens of Flint. So there have been all these closed-door meetings about water quality and data. Closed doors is what brought us into this crisis. Yeah. And you just really see, like, a real disdain for citizens wanting to be engaged in a process that, like, is directly affecting their health, the health yeah. of their children. So there was a town hall report on the water quality, and one of the one of the organizers um, did this amazing protest where they took— and just crinkled water bottles, mm. like, like that, mm-hmm. as this amazing form of protest because they didn't want to yell it'd be disruptive, but it's like wow. just reminding you that we're still using this shit, you know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So um, that is genius. That's really flower genius. organizers. I think are like the shit, mm-hmm. honestly, and that's one of the so one of the things that gives me hope is like the people in Flint who are actually speaking out and have kept this issue mm-hmm. going, and you know our governor. Is uh, <clears throat> I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go too into it, but mm-hmm. you know it's like we're not going out without you. Actually, we're taking you with us if this is where yeah, where you want to go with it. You know, accountability mm-hmm. gotta have it. So, like the fourth thing I would say, national media is reporting about water quality having um, improved, mm-hmm. but the results are very inconsistent. So, if someone is like hearing, like maybe they're listening to NPR and they hear something about oh the lead is federal no mm. it's still very inconsistent mm-hmm. and not only activists but scientists and researchers are saying do not stop filtering your water Man. I, I think i think we need to have consistent long term data that's based on a much larger sample mm. so we're right now we're seeing like okay these federal this le- this level of lead is like under a federal level for these samples but other samples are coming back with higher level you know so we're not mm-hmm. getting a consistency yet for people to feel safe and we're just thinking okay well if we can't use if we have to use these filters then we don't consider this water safe yeah. so the fifth thing i would say is that like this is like really hard because i have a friend who she's pretty sure her child is ha- having cognitive um issues and has cognitive disabilities so there's people who are dealing with the direct aftermath, like the effects on their bodies and yeah. the bodies of their children yeah. and their loved ones. And so like lead line replacement is one thing, but we're really hoping that federal dollars go towards holistic health care. Honestly, mm-hmm. we need to have free health care for if you live in the city of Flint, mm-hmm. you, we, we just need to provide free health care for these citizens, Preach. honestly. And, and a lot of activists are calling for that. But for us, it's like we need to make sure these federal dollars go towards holistic health care mm-hmm. treatment behavioral health care, you know, for young people and families. That's like a big part of it outside of the lines being replaced. Yeah. Yeah. We've been dealing with this crisis for over 600 days now. You might hear 400, but it's been like over 600 days that that we've been dealing with poisoned water. And I think that residents just deserve to not have any issues like i got a i have a water bill and i just look at it like that's cute you know i don't know what you expect me to do not with that you want me to you want me to pay it i don't know so yeah oh, wait. Like, yeah wait, 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 wait. yeah yeah so in your experience from what you know what are good organizations that people can give their money to and their time to to support flint and the people in it if people want to support um, activists, and I would say grassroots activists and organizers that have been doing this work and have brought it to the forefront, um, mm-hmm. whateryoufightingfor.com is a good website that has ways that you can support, whether it's monetarily, whether it's putting pressure on your representatives to talk about federal allocations for Flint. Mm-hmm. And that's water as in W-A-T-E-R. As in what we can't drink in Flint, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. What are you fighting for? And then helpforflint.com. There's a place in Flint called The Granary, and they actually sell the highest quality rated water filter for a whole house filter mm. and even with people sending all these water bottles like there's issues with like recycling so if people really want to support um it's not that hard to i would say what are you fighting for is a good website because they can connect you with a family that could use a home house filter mm-hmm. a whole house filter yeah awesome 
So we've got our directives, folks. For if sure. you're out there, you care about Flint. Um, I care about Flint. I need to do a lot more. Thank you for um, for having me and like even asking yeah. about it. Tuna, thank you so much, y'all. Flint still does not have clean water. It has been at least six hundred days, mm. and we can help. So look into your hearts and into your wallets. Right. And help. Thanks, Tunde. Support for Another Round comes from Squarespace. With Squarespace, you get a unique domain experience that's simple to set up and an all-in-one platform to help you create a beautiful website. Which brings me to a game of Would You Rather Internet Edition. And here is where we invite Tyler Sorensen from BuzzFeed's creative department into the studio to ask me one hard Would You Rather question about the internet. Hi, Tyler. Hey, Tracy. What's up? Not much. I have your question, though, if you want to... Let's do it. Let's do it. Here it is. It's would you rather your employer see your search history (gasps) or your parents? (gasps) Easy answer. I would rather have my employer see my search history because I can blame it on working for a company as strange as BuzzFeed. Like, oh, I had to look up this very embarrassing thing because I'm researching it for a post. But I would have no excuses for my mom. I mean, I guess it could have been just be like, no, it's for work. So you don't really care who I don't sees care. it. Okay. Show it to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Get your unique domain today at squarespace.com. If you sign up for a year, the domain is completely free and you can also save 10% off your first purchase with the offer code another round, as in the title of the wonderful show that you are listening to right now. Make your <laughs> Make your next move with Squarespace. So, ladies and gentlemen, and beautiful ladies in the studio, this is our first. Um, what do you What do you call it when a ship makes its first maiden voyage, inaugural debut? Yeah, all of those words. This is <laughs> this is all of those things. <laughs> we are christening the studio officially. Yes. This is going to be our first full recording of any podcast episode in our very own stud, a stud of one's own. A stud of one's own. So cheers to Miss Kim Drew being hey. our first Woo. our inaugural guest. Yay! Yay. <laughs> doop, doop, doop. Champagne right. terrifies me. <laughs> Listen, whenever anybody opens a bottle, I'm just like, this is going to be the day that I lose an eye. I have video footage <laughs> of my New Year's party when the fucking bottles went off. Oh. And I literally ducked. <laughs> I have slow reflexes, so it didn't help, but I did duck. I mean, that's the slowest reflexes of anybody. <laughs> Literally I've the ever worst seen. reflexes. All right, Kim. So you do all of the things. So let me just briefly list a few. <laughs> You're the social media manager at the Metropolitan Museum of Art here in New York City. You started the hugely popular Tumblr, Black Contemporary Art, which is where I found you personally. You have an Instagram account called Museum Mammy, which has over 100,000, you know, followers. Rolling deep. Yeah, that's a big number. That's a huge number. <laughs> and you did it like a Instagram takeover over the White House. Uh, all the things, all the things, all yeah. the social media plus art things that you can imagine. Kim has done it. <laughs> Welcome, Kim. <Yay! laughs> what? So, what do you what do you mean by museum, mammy? Oh, girl, mammy yeah. is such a loaded word. It and is like, in conjunction with like a space that can be as white as a museum. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, my favorite book is by the poet Gwendolyn Brooks. Her mm. book I love is, Gwendolyn Brooks. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, her book is called Maud Martha. Museum Mammy, before it was Museum Mammy, was actually Maud Mammy because Gwendolyn Brooks' Maud Martha is a book about black female interiority. And the Mammy figure very much is a figure about black female interiority. Mm-hmm. One of my mentors for a very long time has been this person named At Museum Nerd. And so when I came to make my own account um, for actually a research project that I did in undergrad, Museum Mammy was born. Mm. But I do enjoy continuing to understand that it's a difficult name Mm -hmm. and justifying the difficulty that I might create for others. Does it does it make other people uncomfortable? Like, have they like ever asked, like expressed any anxiety over your moniker? My moniker. Moniker. Um, and what do you what do you mean by black female interiority? Yeah. So the only people who have ever come for my moniker are people who are more problematic than I am. Ooh. What does that mean? Which I kind of love. Yeah. They're not people I would ever acknowledge they're existing other than acknowledging them as a collective group mm-hmm. of people who critique the things I do, which is a thing that I also respect. So I don't name names because I appreciate critique. Yeah. Um. But I would describe 
in the way that I say black female interiority is not a thing that like people readily understand. I believe it to be just the right that we have to who we are when we're alone. And I might be wrong, whatever. It's a book where there's not a quote from the protagonist. There's not a point in the in the book where she actually says something. It's all actually written from the perspective of her mind. Mm. And so that for me was really important as a person who overthinks everything. Um, but also I think we all as people reserve the right to have our own like relationship to our own thoughts and, and what our own interiors look like. So that book, that name, all those things all come together in Museum Emmy. Mm, I like it. Okay, so what do you tell people that you do? Well, the thing is that I didn't realize until very recently that it's really confusing mm. because I have my roles and all the things that I do have changed very rapidly in the last year. And so even my family is, I mean, you know, you know the black family struggle where you like go back and they're like, baby, I don't know what you do, (laughs) but you keep paying your bills, Uh you know? So it's like, I work for the internet mama. Right. (laughs) Right. That's a difficult sentence to explain. It's just, that is a whole nother podcast episode. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, My mom didn't really believe that the internet was a thing to continue to deposit anything into until about two years ago. Mm. And now she loves Facebook. Oh but before gosh, that, it was just not a thing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. and you may both know my blog started in 2011. <laughs> so we got some catching up to do. I love that Tumblr. It was such a joy to find when I was just like first doing my tumbles. Yeah. But oh, baby's well, first tumbles. Baby's, baby's first tumbles. First tumbles. <laughs> what, what made you want to start that Tumblr? Well, there's a, there's a lot of reasons. Um, one that I've never actually said is that I was uh, hanging out with a friend. Her name is Grace Michelli. You may know her as Art Baby Girl. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was in Grace's room and using her laptop to do something else. And I opened up a tab and Tumblr came up. And I saw that at the time, I think maybe she had 2,000 followers. And I was like, oh my God, what is this thing? (laughs) And how does she have so many followers? Uh, But that's why I really, I mean, I I had understood what it was before, but I didn't really understand what it could do. Mm -hmm. So it was actually really through my friendship with Grace that I I learned that it was a place that was worth investing in. Mm -hmm. Um, And then aside from that, there's like the Studio Museum route story where I I was an intern there. And during my internship, I, I basically learned how many artists I didn't know. So that was the the Studio Museum in Harlem. Yeah. Which I love. Mm-hmm. Slept I've on. Never been. Slept on. Small museum, but slept on. Yeah. I have a very embarrassing confession to make. Have oh. you never been, Tracy? <laughs> I have not technically been to a museum in New York since I've moved here. I was I went to the Brooklyn what? Museum for like a thing. Yeah. But like not just to like go and like wander around the museums. And you know what? I feel like this is a safe space. I feel like I can trust y'all with my deepest, darkest secrets. You can. Um, I don't enjoy art museums. Why? Um, I go there and I don't really know what to do. I kind of look at the art and I'm like, oh, there's a painting. Oh, there's a painting. Oh, there's a painting. And I think that the reason is because when I was introduced to art, it was just like all old dead white people that I couldn't relate to. And I feel like all of the art that I studied was like a brand new version of like Jesus being taken down from the cross. I'm like, I, I've seen 12. Like, what else is there? You know, like, what else is there? <laughs> and so I feel like by the time I graduated college and no longer had to learn things that people were making me to lo- like learn, I was mm-hmm. like, all right, this never gave me any like particular productive active joy. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, it's just like not my thing. I would much rather go to like a history museum or a science museum or something like that. I have a similar experience. Mm. I've been taken to museums my entire life, but I didn't necessarily think that I was interested in art history at all. Mm. I had started doing art history major because I realized that that was how my brain was hardwired. I knew that I could remember dates and I could remember images mm-hmm. and I, I've always loved history. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't really until I became aware that there were people who looked like me making these images too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah. I and I think that that's really important to understand is that I've come to learn to love all these other things and I've come to learn and understand how all of these other things are made, mm-hmm. but I didn't have an investment in them until I saw that I could also be reflected in those things. Mm-hmm. What was that moment for you? 
I went to the Brooklyn Museum. Mm. Mm. I love the Brooklyn Museum. I do too. I really do. What What was your experience? It was actually like going to see Kende Wiley's work for the first time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it was maybe 2010 or so. But there's three paintings, one on the ceiling and, and both to the left and right of you. And I, I've rarely ever cried in a museum. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the first times what do you, what, I did. W- wow. Describe what you saw and what was it about it that like struck you so much? At the time, it was really just seeing black bodies, period. I am still a basic, <laughs> as a noun, right? Yeah. Uh, and then I was even less knowledgeable than I am now, so mm-hmm. it was just enough. It was yeah. enough to walk into a museum and see myself reflected there. Yeah. How would you describe Kehinde Wiley's work? Like, what were the kinds of things you were looking at? I, oh yeah, good question, yeah. I realize I'm not being illustrative. Um, it's just hard to talk about art on a podcast. It's really hard to talk, I'm like, don't you guys watch Empire? Um, <laughs> Wait, low key though, the first season of Empire, which is the only season I watched. Yeah, same. Is, I, I saw way more contemporary black art in that first season than I probably saw that entire there year. There was a lot, like in the, the home declarations, yeah. and like the office decor, yeah. They were flexing. And it felt so intentional. It did. It, it was. was. Yeah. So you could have seen a Kehinde Wiley painting on Empire, and if you have not, his work is very much a new take on a lot of images from art history. So he will take a lot of the general compositions from masterworks and remake them and also introduce black figures into the paintings. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have these really grand paintings. And and, and I should say more specifically, they're more more like uh, court paintings than anything else. Court as in? Court uh, as in like king and queen. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Court as in these are really made. They're images that are made to show you that the people in them are important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, They're likely made at the time when the person who is in it paid for it. Mm -hmm. And what Kehinde's work does now is invite black figures there into these spaces of saying that the people in this image matter. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what his work does at its most successful. I think that for me, I never had this experience as you were just describing of being young and walking into an art museum and seeing yourself represented there and that was like transformative for you. Mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't have that experience if I've had it explicitly until like I was already like old and bitter and like <laughs> fuck museums all together. Um. <laughs> but also just to not even cut you off because I know you're like mid-thought but Mm-mm. I love when people tell me they don't love museums and I think really? that that's something really important to why? know. Because I want to know why. Because mm-hmm. I'm interested very seriously in helping a lot of people understand mm-hmm. that museums are valuable. And if I don't find out what that is, I will never know why someone else might not feel like they can come. Uh-huh. And I need to know why. Yeah. So once you find out why, what happens? Like, what do you do with that information? Depends. If it's like a one-to-one dialogue, like we can talk through it and my mm-hmm. level of investment in you as a person will then, of course, deem how long the conversation goes because <laughs> I'm not not shallow. Right. Um, but if there's any way that I can bring it back to the work that I'm doing, mm-hmm. yeah, because I don't always want to do the work that I'm doing and I think that you guys feel the same way. Mm-hmm. But those are the moments that I actually pull from when I am weary. Yeah. So I want to try something really quickly. Yes. Um... As somebody who, I mean, I can I can enjoy being at a museum, but I wouldn't be like, this is going to be my Saturday morning activity. I'm always very interested in how people who know art and like study art, look at art and consume it and analyze it and talk about it. Um, I feel the same way about wine sommeliers. Cause I'm like, <laughs> how do you sip this and get hints of fucking shoe leather and apricot? I don't know. Okay. It's amazing. Okay. Shoe leather. <laughs> I don't know. They could tell me anything. And I'd be like, yeah, you must be right. <laughs> so I'm going to show you an image that you have Instagrammed recently and just what talk about it briefly. Describe it to me. Tell me what you see, et cetera, et cetera. And we're going to put this image in our Oh, yeah. yeah. I love this. So this thing that Tracy just showed me is an image from my Instagram account. I posted it, I think, on the weekend, uh, over this past weekend. It is a work by this artist named... Alice Henry, Mm -hmm. and she, I believe, is from Tennessee. I actually very recently did a poll on my Facebook page and asked people which young emerging artists who are black they enjoy. Mm -hmm. And I got a number of really amazing responses, and Alice was one of the people that 
people told me to look into. Mm -hmm. uh, the image that is on my Instagram account is a portrait of a perhaps woman figure. It's made from a mixture of fabrics, and it has many different colors. I mean, it kind of harkens to, like, something that's maybe made out of, like, a potato bag or something like this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it has a very southern aesthetic. The woman has pigtails, and her mouth is open, and I just really love it because it is something that is equally horrifying and absolutely gorgeous. Mm. What do you find horrifying about it? Because she looks like she's scared. I mean, it kind of looks like the scream. It kind of looks mm -hmm. like Munch is the scream. Mm -hmm. I hate when people reference things with other things. Mm. I mean, I, I haven't actually seen the work in person, but I wanted to post it because I think that she's a person whose work I was moved by. Mm -hmm. So that's what it is. I feel like, at least in movies, <laughs> like people, there's like always this very um, characteristic scene of like people standing in front of a piece of art and being very deep in thought and going, mm, how does, what does this mean? How does this make me feel? Is that a real thing that like people do in actual <laughs> art museums? I mean, people do a lot of things yeah. in museums. Like I feel like I don't know how to go <laughs> like through, I don't know how to consume an art museum. I mean, I don't know how to walk into BuzzFeed's office, but I did. <laughs> True. We don't know how to do a lot of the things that we do. Yeah. We find our way there. And I think, per your question about, you know, what if I don't like museums, it's not that you like it or dislike it. Mm -hmm. I care if you try. I care if you feel empowered to enter into this space that, at the best case scenario, mm -hmm. reflects some part of your experience. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the all. the worst case scenario? Oh, the worst case scenario is that you go to a museum and you don't feel like you can see yourself in the things that are there. Because mm -hmm. uh, maybe you went to the wrong museum. You know, not every museum yeah. is for everyone. That's true. What's your favorite museum in New York? The one that I love absolutely the most is obviously the Studio Museum in Harlem, mm. um, without fail. And mm. I really enjoy the way that the Met challenges my relationship to a museum that I love the most. What do you mean? I mean <laughs> that I go. The Met is the most challenging of New York museums because it's three blocks long it and is. it's five thousand years of art history. It, There's nothing easy about it. I feel like I couldn't have even developed a taste for black contemporary art like as a young person because there's no way any moment of my life I would have been exposed to that. Mm. Like even in college. So when were you first exposed to it? After college. Like when you moved to New York? Like on Tumblr. Mm. So Literally it was online. Black versus. contemporary <laughs> art. Look at you putting babies onto the <laughs> No, there's the just world. Yeah. E maybe you're an art history major and maybe there are some black artists that are canon. I don't know if there are. Mm -hmm. Would you say there are a few that are? Canon is relative. Relative, but like if you take one black art history, what are the, who are the like three people they name? Well, you have to find a black art history. And right, that's, that's rare. First and foremost. I, I think especially for New Yorkers, like maybe a Kara Walker is your first introduction to yeah. uh, art in the city or art that you can relate to. Mm -hmm. Art that I'm, features you. Yes. I remember looking at her Sugar Sphinx and thinking... I would have never thought I could do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting that you you guys know when you look at, quote unquote, contemporary art, mm -hmm. people say, oh, a kid could do that. Sure. Yeah, anybody right? can do that. I could do that. Whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a difference in the gesture of saying, I can do that and it's easy. Mm -hmm. They're two different strokes. Yeah. And yeah. I think that the way that you're describing it, I'm really interested in, Heaven, because a lot of people need to hear that mm -hmm. as an empowering thing. Mm -hmm. I can do that is a really dope thing to feel. Yes. And not necessarily something that puts down the thing that you see being done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I make a lot of collage art. Mm -hmm. yes. I didn't know that about you. It's not really a thing I share. Aww. I really enjoy it. You vision board collage. or you just collage? Collages, especially weekly ones, because we have, a, uh, in my household, we have a lot of magazine subscriptions. Mm -hmm. It's really helpful to visualize all the images you've been inundated with the like last two weeks. Yeah. So now we're gonna go to our rapid fire question segment. Oof. This is pew pew pew. Pew pew pew. Pew pew pew. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> pew, pew. Um Oh, sorry. Heaven Jones. <laughs> okay. Would you rather have acrylic paint come from your tear ducts every time you cried or 
have it come shooting out of your nose when you sneezed? I would never use acrylic paint. Oh. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> what do I not know? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Uh, first and foremost. First and foremost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ghetto, not dumb, to quote Cardi B. Yeah. Um, no, I would, I would, I would, okay, so the difference was my eyes or my nose. Mm -hmm. I'd be down with either. Really? Yeah. Just like, cool. I wish my body would produce paint. Mm. Why you know not? What? That's true. That sounds dope. If you sneezed it out, you could just put a canvas in front and just like, bam, you gotta, you gotta. Like, I would bar. prefer that it was something I could choose. Mm hmm. But, yeah. Okay. What what's wrong with acrylic paint? It just it dries faster oh. than oil paint. Okay. What artist from the past, no longer living, would you resurrect to paint your portrait? Ooh. To paint it? That's mm -hmm. a specific or, question. Or to create to create your something portrait. in my image. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think the thing that is mo most interesting to me about that question is the person that I would want to spend that m amount of time with. Because mm. mm. it'd be taking a moment, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just not fast. Even mm -hmm. if someone just takes your picture, I really enjoy sitting for people as a, a, a mutual investment in spending time together. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. That sounds lovely. Don't yeah. let anybody take your picture that you don't like because you can't trust them with your image. Mm -hmm. But that's a personal thing. That's not something I'm trying to posit on you. Yeah. So who would you have create your portrait? I think probably Carrie Mae Weems. Because mm. I like the conversations that we have. Yeah. I would yeah. want to sit with her for literally as long as she would let me. Mm -hmm. So you may know Carrie Mae Weems' work from the Kitchen Table series yes. where she mm -hmm. has a bunch of black women... Uh, black girls, just a series of photographs of them around the kitchen table in a way doing that's what black women so do at yeah. kitchen tables and mm -hmm. feels so just honest and it just really captures the moment. It's really beautiful. It's really and pretty. So relatable. Like yes. that's some shit that like my black ass coming from like Shiny Park in Louisville, you know, can look at him be like, oh, this is a part of like my past. It's a part of my history. Like, yeah, I mean, it's it's images of herself. And she's had series before that. She's had series after that. But that's the one that we tacked on to the most because it is her imaging herself. Mm. It is her inviting other people. I personally tack on to it because it was shot in Northampton, Massachusetts, mm. which is where my college was. And that was not a thing I knew originally. But, I didn't know that until right now. But it's really fun. Because mm -hmm. Northampton is an amazing town. Question mark. Oh, you said someone who's not living also. So Cameron Williams is living, but if I had to pick someone who isn't... Mm -hmm. Uh, perhaps I would pick um, Augusta Savage, who's a sculptor. Mm, I'm not familiar with Augusta She Savage. makes sculptures in a lot of different medium, and I'm pretty sure she's not living. If she is, I'm very sorry. Mm. Um, but she makes largely abstract as in abstracted from reality, but mm -hmm. not necessarily abstract because they're still representational mm -hmm. sculptures of people. Mm -hmm. And I would love to look at one of her sculptures that is of me. I'm excited to brush up on her work now. I'm very excited. She's really cool. And her name is Augusta. I mean, I've never, ever, ever in my life met, like, a whack Augusta. Yeah? What was um, prep school in Rhode Island like? This Girl. sounds like the whitest, the whitest shit. Yeah, I mean, it was. Did you? Do you feel like you've learned how to deal with, like, the white spaces of the museum art world through the white space of the prep school? I... Learn there very specifically that not everyone's going to agree with you. In the same way that even the people who were in more more empowered than I was there also learned that. Mm -hmm. It was a difficult campus because I was I was in boarding school. I feel like one of the the black contemporary ish artists that most people would know is Basquiat. Right. Mm -hmm. And he has that, that this famous quote about I was tired of seeing white walls and white spaces with white people. I think uh, Zora Neale Hurston has a similar thing that's like, I feel the most colored when I'm thrown against a sharp white background. Mm -hmm. Which, girl, <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> and Morgan Parker has a great poem about that. Contemporary poet. Contemporary poet mm -hmm. and queen. Mm -hmm. Queen. But prep school is tight. Like, prep school is tight. I think it's a great education to get. I feel very privileged to have gotten mm -hmm. it. It was an education that I worked for. Did you learn about art there? No. I, I, I'm curious 
Always yeah, no, no, no. I, I didn't mean to say that you would assume that I like wouldn't or whatever, but I, I didn't. I didn't. Fancy schools have fancy stuff. Yeah. Fancy schools have fancy stuff. I happened to have gone to a boarding school that didn't have a museum on campus. I went to a college that did, and I think that's also important to note in my story. Hmm. We're we're <clears throat> familiar with the with the hashtag carefree black girls because mm-hmm. that's what we aspire to. Mm-hmm. But, Do you really? But well, okay. So let's get into it because yeah. you notice. I mean, your, I'm down to talk about that. Yeah. You noticed in your sure. Instagram profile that you have careful black girl, uh-huh. hashtag careful black girl, yeah. or hashtag carefree black yeah. girl. Talk to us. What does that mean to you? Yeah, I mean, never. No one's ever asked me about that, and I'm really mm. glad someone finally did. Hey, we do our research. Do it. I mean, carefree black girl. Buzzfeed did a carefree black girl and was like, everybody's carefree. Like, <laughs> I think that that's a great sentiment. I don't I don't say that it's a bad one, but I think in in actuality, we are just not afforded that. Mm. I always assumed it was aspirational. I don't I I don't think anyone's carefree. I right. I have so many worries. (laughs) (laughs) So many cares. (laughs) Too many one might say. Too many one might say. Yeah. That's, that's real. That's, the reason it, it exists is friend of the show, Collier Mayerson. Yeah. So Collier is a reporter at Fusion. Uh, please note, she has an Emmy and an NABJ award. I mean. Girl. Girl. So she put out that blog, Carefree White Girls. It was a thing. They mm-hmm. were like, they were eating yogurt. They were f- in a field of daisies. They were yeah. all over the place. At flower halos. Sure. And tiny shorts. So, Pre-Snapchat flower halos. <laughs> Pre-Snapchat flower <laughs> yes. halos. Yes. So it was a moment where I think the internet was like, oh my God, enough of these white girls. Mm-hmm. We want to put out like our own vision of what we want to be. Mm-hmm. I never thought of it as like, we are carefree because we're not. Yeah. We cannot be the carefree white girls. I've always seen it as like um, in casting ourselves in the light of carefreeness, Mm. it shows like the extent to which we don't have it, you know? And this is kind of like, this is what my motherfucking Instagram would look like if I was carefree. These are the snaps that I would like pick and choose and like share with everybody. So what was, what was careful black girl for you? Careful black girl for me? Well, because I never read carefree as a joke. I never read carefree as a thing that, was complicated. Mm. And I didn't know Collier before very recently. So for me, I felt that Carefree in some way made it so that there was a choice that we had that I don't think we're afforded, quite Mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just wanted to iterate to people, I am careful. Mm. I am careful all the time. I'm careful right now talking to you guys very candidly. And I trust you both, but I would talk to you very differently if we weren't recording this podcast. Mm-hmm. Because I have a lot to lose. Because I've earned a lot. And you've earned know. them in a world that doesn't want to give you anything. I'm in a world where people just didn't expect me. Mm-hmm. And it's not even that people didn't want me to have it. Because I, I very genuinely believe that people wanted me. But I do know that they didn't expect it. And so I'm careful. I'm careful with that. Mm-hmm. Ms. Kim Drew, where can people find you and your work? So my website's museummammy.club. Mm-hmm. My handle on Twitter and Instagram is Museum Mammy. So uh-huh. it's all Museum Mammy. All right. And then blackcontemporaryart.tumblr.com. Evan, what up? We did it. We did it. We did it. Hooray! Uh, <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> Hooray! You sound like um, what's his name from Pooh Corner? The little the owl from what? From Pooh. Welcome to Pooh Corner. Who's that? Winnie the Pooh. Oh, I didn't like Winnie the Pooh. You know, I get it. Like Eeyore got on my nerves. He was so fucking much. I was just like, why can't y'all piglet? see that Eeyore needs? He needs. He needs y'all. He's chronically I mean, depressed. Obviously, I am. Yeah, ER. but I was just like, nobody is like trying to help. We're trying to help dude out. You know, I didn't think about that universe. They're not good friends to him. Mm-mm. They're not very supportive. How do His we tail get here? falls off all the time. I don't know. We. I'm trying to buy rounds. You don't know about Eeyore's tail? I forgot about the tail. His tail is tacked onto his ass. It's like nailed. Right, right in the butt cheeks. I forgot about that. Wow. That's that rude. fucking sucks. So I'm depressed and there's literally a nail piercing my ass can i can i get a break 
I'm sorry. I just got very impassioned about Eeyore. You know what? We're buying rounds right now. I had a round before. I'm going to shelve it. We're going to do it later. I'm buying a round for Eeyore because, listen, Eeyore was going through some shit. I just, I never even, I didn't, I have never thought this much about the Winnie the Pooh universe. It's fucked up. But, yeah, what's good, Christopher Robin? Yeah. What's good? Okay. Who or what is your round for? Okay. So, I want to buy a round for the podcast Making Oprah. Ooh, I've not heard this yet. So Making Oprah is a limited series podcast. It's like four episodes. It's like three episodes and then like some extra episodes. Some How bonus long are the episodes? episodes? Maybe like an hour. Okay. So it's like a documentary. Mm-hmm. It's like in- investing in a documentary. Mm-hmm. So it's the making of the Oprah Winfrey show. Okay. Anyways, literally it's a podcast called Making Oprah. So it could not have been more tailor-made to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a podcast <laughs> about how to be more like Oprah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Heaven's interests have been met. Uh-huh. Yes. So it's produced by WBEZ Chicago. And this black woman wants to get to the bottom of, like, how Oprah began, what were her competitors. I want, like, the full mm-hmm. story of, like, the Oprah Winfrey show's trajectory. Mm-hmm. The things they were doing, the things that were different about what they were doing, how they got to be, like, as big as they got. Mm-hmm. It was not certain it would be this way. Hmm. It was not I'm certain so intrigued. in 1980s fucking America mm. that a black woman in Chicago with a talk show would right. become, like, the the world's most powerful woman. Yeah. World's most powerful black person mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in so many ways. So, one, the the person who's hosting this podcast is clearly hyped to see Oprah, mm-hmm. to interview her. Mm-hmm. So a part of you is just, like, excited for that journey. Mm-hmm. You're just like, yes, girl, you got it. You got it. <laughs> you, can, you can hear her like, oh, my God, Mom, it's going to happen. Uh-huh. It's so cute. So a part, of just, like, a part of it is just that emotional investment. Yeah. But they did get to interview Oprah. They interviewed, like, the person who first interviewed her for, for the job. job oh my god like can you imagine joe hired <laughs> oprah can you imagine oprah on a job interview yo what and there's this incredible clip of her saying like i you know i i wanted to remind them like you know i'm a black woman who's like overweight mm. you know that right mm-hmm. guys like yeah i know damn and there's a moment in the first episode that i started to cry oh because of course <laughs> But it's when she's talking about when she first got to Chicago, how she knew she was on the right path. Mm -hmm. It was almost a calling, almost destiny that she had to be there. Wow. Did you cry because you felt that before or because you have a longing to feel that? I felt that before. Mm. I got to New York. Aww. And I was like, this is it. Mm. Do you know, did I ever tell you what the, the thing with my birthmark is? Yeah, it means that, like, everybody's got to know your name or something like that. So my birthmark is the big blonde streak in the middle of my hair. Mm -hmm. Which is a dope-ass birthmark, by the way. I agree. (laughs) I slay. (laughs) No, in Ethiopian mythography, it means your name will be known throughout the world. It is destined. People will know who you are. Mm -hmm. And you felt that when you got to New York? I did. Aww. And Oprah felt it when she got to Chicago. And I just, I I started bawling. Aww. I feel that when I step inside a Krispy Kreme. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> wow I am where I need to be wow <laughs> that's exactly how I felt but I just feel so undermined <laughs> no at a Krispy Kreme <laughs> no 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 I just really love donuts that's all you find your vision in Krispy Kreme <laughs> I mean maybe is that allowed that's allowed I just was really not expecting that <laughs> anyways making Oprah is so much fun you should listen mm. to it you should listen to her competition and what they said about her mm. you should see what like early Oprah was versus like more thoughtful Oprah and mm-hmm. like how she meditated on what is she even putting out in the world oh my god Oprah god bless you um, I'm gonna put it on my list of podcasts to check out at some point this year limited series so it's something I can commit to mm. shout out to Oprah shout out to Oprah shout out to WBEZ shout out to Public Radio shout out to Eeyore shout out to Eeyore fucking Eeyore man we're all out here trying to function that's all I wish your people cared about you bruh <laughs> I know Hey. We did it again. We did it again. We did it again. And I'll do it again. Hell yeah. All right. We did it. Hey. Um, thank you so much to the lovely Kim Drew for stopping by and enlightening us and teaching me how to museum. Mm-hmm. Um uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take my black ass to an art museum. Yeah, let's go on a field trip. <gasps> 
Field trip, field trip, field trip. Field trip. You can follow Kim Drew at Museum Mammy. That's M-U-S-E-U-M-M-A-M-M-Y on both Twitter and Instagram. And you should check out her Tumblr, blackcontemporaryart.tumblr.com, which has helped to make Young Heaven into the person who she is now. An art connoisseur. If you will. I will allow it <laughs> myself. <laughs> Thanks again to our boo and friend of the show, Mr. Tunde Olaniran. You can find him at Tunde Olaniran on Twitter, and that is T-U-N-D-E-O-L-A-N-I-R-A-N. Um, listen to everything that this man makes. Follow him on Twitter. He's he's so great. Shout out to the Paw Squad. Paw Squad. Bah, bah, bah. Yeah, that was good. That was hey. good. Every week you improve, Aww. and I feel so much happier. Aww. This episode was produced by Nina Paddock. And Julia Ferlin with editorial oversight from Miss Eleanor Kagan and Meg Kramer, and production support from Chiquita Pascal. Thank you to our in house musicians, Miss Jean Gray and Don Will. You can follow Jean Gray at Jean Greasy and Don Will at Don Will. Um, follow Heaven on Twitter at Heaven Rants. Yeah, you can see all the shows that I'm doing. Ooh. Yeah. I should start following you on Twitter. Oh, my God. Stop. It. I'm joking. <laughs> you know I follow you. You guys should follow Tracy at Brokeeping Poverty. Yeah, I'll be talking about stuff. She's funny. Oh, my God. I thoroughly enjoy Tracy's <laughs> Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my Thank gosh. Um, so do those two things. And then also hit us up on email and Twitter, Facebook. Hit us on the buzz, if you will. I will. Uh, thank you. We are another round on all of the things. Rate us on iTunes. Tell a friend. It's my favorite gift to give people. Take their phone. Subscribe them to another round on iTunes. Mm, but give the phone back so that you can be charged with theft. Absolutely. And be like, I'm clearly not looking at your nudes, okay? <laughs> I'm in your podcast app. <laughs> so calm the fuck down. <laughs> Subscribe to our newsletter. We're going to have so many great things from today's episode in there. Go to buzzfeed.com slash another round slash newsletter. Drink some water. Take your meds. Call your person. Change your toothbrush. Let me tell you, mm. I changed the head on my uh, little mechanical. like. The oh, little, ooh, look at you. And Swag I was you out. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I went to the dentist. Mm, I need to do I'm not that. trying to level up. I mean, no, it's fine. You know, just like, oh, I see your... Your cute little uh, toothbrush. I see your cute little toothbrush. Your little toothbrush. It's I cute. That. It's cute. Also, the sense of like, what the fuck when a dentist is like all up in your shit and it's like, oh, your gums are bleeding because you don't floss. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, all these medieval torture devices you just put in my mouth <laughs> are the reason my gums are bleeding. Um, also, floss. Everybody's very floss. important. No, Tracy's right. You I be floss. telling y'all. I be telling you do be you. telling us. I even told you like the Find floss you like. Okay, but the best floss though. Floss tape. Yes. Tracy, you've been you been on. I know. Who's gonna take me off? Who Nobody. Is, exactly. Nope. Beyonce, okay. Beyonce, play us out. <laughs> wait, wait. Also, drink some water, take your meds, and call your person. Beyonce, play us out. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. I woke up like this. I woke up like this. We flawless. Ladies, tell them I woke up like this. We did it. We did it. We did it. We we did it. We 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 did it. We did it. We did it. <laughs> oh my god. Did you see RuPaul's Drag Race last night? Of course I did. It blew my mind. It's all I ever talk about, and I can't find anybody to talk about it with, so I am so thankful that you're here. I mean, you have become my RuPaul's Drag Race soulmate, and I am thrilled that we have a new podcast at BuzzFeed called The Library, where this is all we talk about. Here, it truly is RuPaul's best friend race. <laughs> I could not agree with you more. So join us every Saturday as we recap the latest episode of Season 9 and gag over TV's best reality show. Tune in wherever you find your podcasts.